Uh, we're going to change gears, and I'm going to turn it over to and, and thinking about some of the new ways we think about how we care for patients and some of the great new opportunities around us, and uh, turn it over to Dr. Hetty Addy. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you, guys. It's really hard to follow Dr. Trotman's uh, grand rounds last week with all the glamour and um, the amazing uh, photo op at the end, um, but I'll do my best to talk about the Debbie Downer of a talk about gangrene, but uh, bear with me here. <laughs> um, this is my disclosure. So these are some disclaimers. And the very first disclaimer I'm going to tell you is I'm not a basic scientist. So if you're going to ask me any questions at the end about specific basic science stuff, I'm going to tell you to refer to slide three. Um, this talk really covers a very, very basic component of um, stem cell therapy for arterial disease, because that's a very complex topic, and it's much more than I can cover in a very short period of time. And I think what drives most of us, or probably all of us, when it comes to research or what we're interested in, is our own anecdotal experiences of the, about the patients that we take care of. And, and I didn't put a slide in there, but I really have to thank all the patients that actually put themselves in these studies, because remember, at the end of the day, stem cell trials are still completely experimental. And you're asking these patients to take a leap of faith and enroll in a trial. They don't know whether or not the results are going to be in their favor. So I put this picture here. This is an actual picture that a patient sent us. And for those of you in the back that can't see, that's the toe in question. But the irony isn't lost on any vascular surgeon when they get a patient to send them a photo of their toe right next to an ashtray of cigarettes um, and the roll of toy toilet paper on the, on the side there, which is going to lead me to my one and only uh, uh, comment, you know, a lot of times we, we have people show these amazing quotes and it's very inspirational. I write it down and I take a picture. The only thing I could come up with was this, and that's from Dr. Kevin. So if you're going to take anything from this talk, please let it not be this slide because there are days where I say in the OR too that God hates vascular surgeons, otherwise they wouldn't, he wouldn't put all those bowels in front of the aorta. But um, so this talk, really, my objectives are to talk to you a little bit about the challenges of peripheral arterial disease, um, discuss some of the stem cell therapies that are out there for arterial disease, and then review some of the trials we're going to be participating here at UC Davis. This is the shameless plug portion of this talk. Um, for those of you that don't know this, we have a lot of students in the audience. I'm going to just spend a few minutes just talking about arterial disease of the lower extremities. This affects about 8 to 12 million. This is probably an old quote. I'm sure this number is higher now. Um, worldwide, it's estimated that it affects 200 million plus individuals. The prevalence, of course, increases with our aging population. So about 20 to 25 percent of patients over the age of 75 will have arterial disease. Remember, all of them are not going to be um, symptomatic, but they will have arterial disease. One in three patients that has diabetes over the age of 50 will have some, some component of arterial disease. And the sad part is that about 30% of patients won't be eligible for any kind of revascularization. So a lot of these stem cell studies here, at least in the States, um, are really geared towards critical limb ischemia. And what does that mean? That means somebody who has either rest pain, they have pain in their legs all the time, or they have some tissue loss or gangrene. Um, and they tend to have multi-level disease, meaning it's not just one segment of the artery that's occluded, but they tend to have disease in multiple segments. They can have it in their superficial femoral artery. A lot of them will have blood vessel disease in their legs. So, sorry, I don't know if this point at work. So this is a normal artery. So this should be an angiogram of anybody in this room where you have actually named vessels. Here's an angiogram of someone who has critical limb ischemia. As you can see, there's not a lot of named vessels, you could really make it out that this is something or this is something, but most of these are really collaterals. <laughs> so critical limb ischemia, we, we estimate that about 500 to 1,000 new cases every year per million individuals in the U.S. And that's 1 to 3 percent of all the patients that have peripheral arterial disease. And the risk factors are things that you can always think about, right? Diabetes, smoking, um, age greater than 65, hypercholesteremia. The three-year limb loss for this population is up to 40%. And about 25% of patients that have critical limb ischemia will die within a year. So the treatment options that we use for critical limb ischemia or really arterial disease are either endovascular, so we either do ballooning or stenting, we fix arteries that have blockages, or we do a surgical bypass, primary leg amputation, and you can also do wound care, right? You can do supportive therapy, but unfortunately most of those patients will require an amputation if they don't get revascularized. 
So amputation is a big deal. Anyone who's been on the vascular service has done one or two amputations. All the interns on third years probably by now know how to do an amputation, unfortunately. Um, it's estimated 185,000 amputations are done in this country, and that's probably half of them or more than half of them are really due to arterial disease and diabetes. Um, and as you can imagine, hospital costs are staggering. Um, the sad part is, and this is the thing I always tell the patients, that very few patients will ever walk with a prosthesis. So these are not 20-year-olds who had an injury in Iraq and come back and they can walk in this amazing prosthesis with an above-knee amputation. Most of our patients, as you know, are older patients. They have multiple comorbidities. Very few of them are ever going to walk on a prosthesis. And the other thing is that half the all, all of the diabetic patients that we see that get an amputation, unfortunately, a majority of them will require the other limb to be amputated in the next few years. But what are our limitations? So we have some limitations. We're going to find patients that are not uh, candidates for revascularization. They have long segment occlusions, or they're not candidates for bypass. They're either too sick to have a bypass, they don't have adequate vein for a conduit, they don't have any targets. So remember, for a bypass, you got to bypass to an artery that has a name and it goes somewhere. And if you don't have that, you don't have can you're not a candidate. So a lot of these patients will either have had a prior bypass that has failed, or they have failed their endovascular interventions. So there's very specific goals for stem cell therapy for peripheral arterial disease. So as you can imagine, it, it's really going to serve as an alternative for patients that don't have any more options left. The goal is ultimately to reduce the number of amputations, and hopefully, hopefully you can improve the quality of life of these patients. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stem cell therapies, but as no, as I'm sure there's a few of you out in the audience who are experts in stem cell therapy, uh, you probably know this, there's lots of different kinds that people have been using. Most people kind of break it down into the adult stem cells, like the blood-forming ones or the mesenchymal ones or the supporting cells. All the pluripotent cells with the embryonic and the induced pluripotent cells. Most of the stem cell trials for critical limb ischemia have used the bone marrow, a patient's own bone marrow, um, to study the effects of uh, stem cell therapy for arterial disease. The second most common is using patients' peripheral blood. Um, there's not a lot of data about using cord blood. There was a study of um, allogenic human umbilical cord uh, mesenchymal <laughs> cells that were used for patients with arterial disease, and they had some improvement in ulcer healing and um, breast pain in patients mm -hmm. with arterial disease. So the mechanism of mesenchymal cells, again, when you open a book or read a paper about all of this stuff, they do lots of things, right? Mesenchymal uh, cells functions can include rescue and repair of damaged tissue, angiogenesis, they secrete lots of hormones and lots of factors. They recruit other uh, stem cells and also prevent apoptosis. So whether all of this stuff is happening as you're treating these patients is something that probably nobody really knows. The bone marrow con concentrates, as you can imagine, it's got a whole slew of cells, right? You're going to have some endothelial progenital cells in these, mesenchymal cells, uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And remember, angiogenesis occurs through some migration of endothelial cells that undergo tube formation and remodeling. So these uh, bone marrow cells migrate to ischemic endothelial surfaces, and this is sort of the thought that what happens is then they secrete these growth factors. So these could be the vascular endothelial growth factors, transforming growth factors, and the fibroblast growth factors. Um, this is just a little schematic of what sort of I just talked about, about bone marrow uh, concentrate and what they do. You know, they release these factors that affect angiogenesis, they activate and recruit other stem cells, and also prevent apoptosis. This is another schematic of some of the mechanisms we think that happens here, whether it's angiogenesis, where you're forming new vessels from uh, factors such as VEGF, uh, or whether you know using bone marrow and these progenitor cells, you're able to release cytokines and have new vascular genesis, or arteriogenesis, where you're just increasing the number and the size of collaterals through these factors. So how do we administer stem cells to patients? There's two routes. There is either the intramuscular route, which is you inject exactly as it sounds. You inject about a, you know, half a cc or 70.75 cc's of uh, the cells or the, uh, the concentrate directly into the muscle. You can inject them into the muscle, into the foot, and we've done all of these uh, here at UC Davis. There's also the interarterial method. This is, of course, as you can imagine, a little bit more involved. You actually have to do an angiogram. You have to kind of position the catheter and a balloon 
somewhere where you think it's going to get to something, right? We have a lot of occlusion. So you either try to get it down into the profunda, which is usually the artery that's opening these patients, or you put it down as far as you can and hope that some of these go into the collaterals. The interesting thing is that um, most studies have shown that there's no difference between interarterial and uh, intramuscular injection. So as you can imagine, probably that's a better thing for us because doing an IM injection is so much easier. You can actually do this in clinic. You give patients a little dose of morphine, some, uh, I don't know, Versed, something, and you can inject their leg and you're done in 10 minutes versus having to take them to a cath lab, do the conscious sedation, get arterial axes, and you have to deal with some of the complications of um, having, ha having to do a, a procedure percutaneously. So this study um, looked at 41 patients with critical limb ischemia, and they actually randomized them to either getting it intramuscular or intraarterial. Their primary endpoints were limb salvage and improvement in wound healing in six months. The one thing that they did here that I really liked is that they actually looked at the differences between the responders. So the responders were people that were considered those that actually healed their wounds versus non-responders non to see if there was a difference in some of the uh, cytokines and things that were released in their bloodstream. The secondary endpoints were changes in uh, transcutaneous oxygen, the Rutherford category, which is what we use to define whether somebody has rest pain, tissue loss, gangrene, quality of life, and also pain. Four patients died. Again, this goes back to one of the first slides I showed you that said 25% of patients with critical limb ischemia will die within a year. So four patients died from heart failure or myocardial infarction or pneumonia. These are sicker patients. This is a sick population. At six months, combined primary endpoint of limb salvage and wound healing was about was met in about 27 patients, so it was 73%. 10 patients required major amputation. There was no difference in any of these endpoints between the intramuscular and intraarterial. The prevalence of limb salvage at six months was about 72% in the intramuscular group compared to 74% in the intraarterial group, and that was not significantly different. Wound healing was about the same, and it wasn't different between the two groups. So they actually did this. Now, very few studies actually do this because, as you can imagine, it's hard and it's expensive to do an angiogram before and after, but um, some studies actually look and they categorize the number of collateral vessels and the size of them uh, to take a look to see. They actually, even though, like, if you look at this and this, you think this looks better, but overall, I think they had no statistically significant difference in the number of collaterals in these studies. But what they did find is that um, the transcutaneous oxygen levels for all the groups had improved. Um, there wasn't much difference in ABI. And remember, ABI is a hard number, which is the ankle brachial index. It's a very cheap way for us to determine whether somebody has arterial disease. A lot of these patients tend to have calcified vessels and are diabetic, so it's hard to compress their vessels. So the ABI is not the greatest thing to probably measure. Toe pressures are probably a better measurement. Their pain score, quality of life, wound size, all of these things improve with all of these uh, treatments, but really there was no treat, a difference in the uh, IM group and the IA group. Um, this was a picture that um, they had used for a patient who, after six months of bone marrow uh, cell therapy, uh, had an improvement in their transcutaneous <coughs> oxygen and, and had wound healing. Uh, what they looked at in terms of the responders and non-responders is that they looked at their CD34 levels uh, and they found that the patients that were responders had a much higher CD34 levels. And this, I will talk very briefly later on about the types of cells that uh, probably are more critical than others. They looked at um, CRP, uh, C-reactive protein, and they saw that the non-responders had a much higher level of CRP. And then they looked at uh, leukocytes in the peripheral blood, and again, non-responders had a higher level. So can you, these are interesting because it tells you maybe you can estimate who or potentially uh, figure out who may or may not be a responder, but can you change these factors? Who knows, right? How can you change somebody's leukocyte or CRP levels? But it gives you an idea of what to expect when you do these treatments. Um, a study by uh, Homonome, which I'm probably saying incorrectly, they looked at 17 patients. Now this wasn't a, a randomized study, but they used this rapid point of care processing that uses an invest investigational drug to aspirate cells from the iliac crest, and they use those um, cells to um, do intramuscular injection of these 17 patients who had critical limb ischemia. And they looked at um, basically perfusion by looking at the ankle brachial index and transcutaneous oxygen, pain score, the six-minute walk test, clinical exam, amputation-free survival, and then degree of angiogenesis by having a before and after um, angiography. 
these are pretty common uh, endpoints for most of the studies. So you're looking at primarily amputation. Are you have an amputation at six months? Do you have an amputation at 12 months? What do the other numbers look like? Are you having less pain? Is the wound healed? So these are fairly common in most of these studies, as you can imagine. So with this study, they, they found that their ABIs actually had improved post, and all of these were statistically significant. They looked at also their mean uh, walking distance, which had improved in this group of 17 patients. Their rest pain scores had also decreased over the span of the 12 months of the study, as well as the mean uh, claudication pain scores. So at 12 months, all of these patients had their ulcers and wounds healed. Uh, the median time to major amputation was six months. Amputation rate at 12 months was about 17%. Their amputation-free survival was about 70%. So they did CT angiography before and after for these patients, and they looked at the degree of angiogenesis. And again, they had a unique way of looking at the number and the size of the collaterals and the proximal mid and distal limb, and they had a significant increase in the, in the collaterals and the distal thigh and the proximal leg uh, when they compared these to, to these baselines. So as you can see, it's a little hard to see, but here, um, this is one patient, this is post-intervention, so they sort of, uh, these were statistically significant when they compared them to um, their baseline. Um, how many of you guys remember seeing this advertisement kind of all over UC Davis? This was probably a year or two years ago. Thank you, Misty. Uh, <laughs> She, yeah, she had some, there was some couple of television uh, things too, and, uh, and she was actually one of our patients who was in the stem, one of the stem cell studies that we did, and stem cells got her back on her feet. So she was part of the mobile trial. So the mobile trial was the intramuscular administration of autologous bone marrow for limb salvage and critical limb ischemia. So these were patients with either rest pain or Rutherford fire, which was tissue loss, with no options for revascularization. So it meant either they had had previous bypasses, or they had some intervention and they had no more options, and here they are. Uh, they were double-blinded, placebo-controlled trials, so we actually had to do these in the OR. Um, we did bone marrow aspirate. This is what we worked with. Uh, I don't aspirate from bone marrow, so actually we had a hematologist do that. We spun the cells down in their gizmo, which was part of the company's um, uh, device, and then we injected 35 to 40 sites. So the placebo patients basically got a little Band-Aid over their iliac crest, and then I just injected, uh, not really injected, but I just poked their leg with a bunch of needle pokes so they thought that they actually had received the treatment because this was blinded. So this study had 152 limbs randomized, 119 in treatment, 36 in placebo. We actually had seven patients in this trial, so we actually did pretty well. Um, they looked at amputation-free survival at 52 weeks. Uh, they also looked at ankle brachial index, transcutaneous oxygen measurement, six-minute walk test. These were the secondary endpoints. Um, they found no difference in adverse and severe adverse outcomes for the placebo and the um, uh, group that got the uh, concentrated bone marrow aspirate. Um, death plus amputation was about 30% uh, percent in the placebo group versus 20%. This wasn't statistically significant. Major amputation was 22 in placebo and 15 in the, in the treatment group, and that was not significant either. What they did do is that they broke these groups down a little bit and did subgroup analysis. So when they actually looked at just Rutherford Fort, meaning rest pain, no tissue loss, these, the patients that were in the treatment group did better, and there, that was statistically significant. When they looked at patients had tissue loss, so they were in Rutherford 5 category, uh, there was no difference between the patients. And then when they looked at non-diabetic patients, again, they saw a di difference that was statistically significant in the treatment group versus the placebo group. So if you excluded everybody who had a wound that was diabetic, you had great results, which is unfortunately not our reality, right? Most of our patients are diabetic, and most of them are going to have wounds. Um, so these were the findings of this study, um, which, you know, I think, we all hoped that it would be perfect for everybody, but unfortunately it wasn't, and you had to exclude a lot of patients to actually see statistical significance. This was another study we were a part of. This just finished last year, and the final papers haven't come out. So Juventus has done a large number of studies for stem cell um, work in arterial disease. This, this study, we had four patients in this study. There were 120 patients randomized to receive a JVS100, which is a gene therapy that encodes stromal cell drive uh, factor. And this DNA ba basically encodes proteins that are involved in production of blood vessels, and it was designed to stimulate um, growth of vessels to provide more routes for reaching the ischemic tissue. Um, so patients with PAD that underwent some revascularization below the knee, whether it was a bypass or some angioplasty, could be randomized if they had a non-healing wound. 
and they either received the JVS 100 or they received placebo, and we did this in clinic. Um, and then they looked at their wound healing rates at three months and six months. Um, this was their. This came from their abstract, which they just presented to the American College of Cardiology. They're still looking at their long-term data. Uh, it's not published yet, but unfortunately, they found that they had 25% of the wounds had healed at three months, and that wasn't different between the treatment and the. Uh, uh, and the placebo group. About, of the four patients we enrolled here, actually, three patients completely healed their wounds. I'm going to just show you one of our patients here. Um, he was, you know, the typical vascular patient that we see, 74 year old with diabetes, hypertension, uh, atrial fibrillation, chronic kidney disease, that presented with a very large uh, wound on his heel, um, and his toe brachial index, which is, you know, measuring sort of what, you know, in terms of perfusion, because his ankle brachial index was invalid was about 0 0.40. And again, we need something above 0 0.60 to kind of assume that they're going to have the potential to heal. And this was his angio before we did it. So this is anterior tibial artery, which was the only vessel open. We ballooned this, and this is the final result. Um, uh, where's Stephanie? Stephanie probably recognizes this heel <laughs> because, <laughs> so this was a before, and this is an after. And I'm not going to tell you this was the week after, okay? This is a labor of love here. This is a lot of admissions to the hospital, a lot of sending him to a nursing home so that he doesn't walk on it, a lot of wound care, a lot of love. But this guy has actually maintained this. He still has his leg. And as you can see, his toe brachial index doubled after this procedure. So again, of the four patients we have, three of them are still healed. And that, again, when I talk about, we see things in our anecdotal experience drives us to have an interest in something. This is what I believe in. It's not perfect. I know Pevec always criticized stem cell therapy because he said it's kind of like voodoo, but if it helps some patients, then I think it's worth trying. And most of these patients are more than happy to be involved because they really are at a point where they have no more options left and amputation is the only thing on the table. Um, so there's been a large number of meta-analyses. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a clock here. I talk fast. I don't know what time it is, but I think I'm on time still. Probably we'll finish a little bit. <laughs> Um, so there have been a large number of uh, meta-analyses looking at all these stem cell therapies. Because again, it's hard to kind of read 100 papers and figure out where we're at with this. Overall, as you can imagine, these are well tolerated. If you do IM or intra-arterial, they're pretty safe. You're not doing a major operation. They're not done under general anesthesia. The most frequent adverse event you're going to have is some pain at the sites where you're injecting. Now, some of the rare complications, worsening critical limb ischemia, which is going to happen. Um, you know, a drop in your hematocrit. This growing hematoma, stem thrombosis, pseudoaneurysm, obviously goes with the group that gets the intraarterial therapy, hypertension. Again, there's not a lot of complications involved with these procedures. Pulling this, these data from these meta-analyses is pretty difficult because these are very heterogeneous populations. You know, some groups will exclude patients with diabetes. Majority of almost all of them will exclude patients who have kidney disease, which is a large number of our patients. Um, all-cause mortality, again, most of these studies have shown there's no difference between patients who get treatment and patients who don't. Um, ulcer healing, um, there were six studies that evaluated 253 limbs. They revealed no benefit in ulcer healing rate. Three randomized controlled trials looking at 123 patients revealed that the ulcer healing rate was improved com compared to no, uh, no cell therapy, and this was statistically significant. Um, and ABI improvements have been shown in several studies, transcutaneous oxygen improvements have been shown in about four studies. The pain score or walking test, um, most of these, and even when we had patients that we knew were in the placebo group with the mobile study, they all reported that they were walking better. So I think you get a little bit of that placebo effect with these, with these patients, so the, main, the mean pain score improved in most of these studies. Uh, rest pain improved in six studies that were looking at specifically mononuclear cells. There was no change in seeing uh, pain-free walking um, for two of those studies. And then some of those mesenchymal stem cell studies showed that there was some improvement in uh, pain-free walking. Amputation rates, there were two prior uh, meta-analyses that revealed there was no difference in the amputation rates for patients who had received bone marrow therapy or um, uh, uh, any kind of a peripheral therapy versus those that had not received that. Some of the pooled analysis by CADRA uh, revealed that the amputation rates were overall reduced by half among the five um, randomized controlled trials of the mesenchymal cells and um, two of the random, I'm sorry, two of the randomized mesenchymal cells and the mononuclear cells. All of those reported that half of their, pa their amputation rates were reduced by half. 
Uh, we et al. who actually looked at another meta-analysis, they, they found no improvement in amputation rates for nine studies with uh, bone marrow cell therapies. <laughs> this is a very busy slide, but I just want you to kind of appreciate the fact that most of these, you know, when they looked at all-cause mortality, it was either not significant or some of them hadn't even reported it. Um, amputation rates, there's some improvement in some. Some of the other ones, not significant. Um, and same thing with breast pain. Again, it's all over the place. So unfortunately, there isn't one uh, cell therapy, whether it's mesenchymal, mononuclear, where you say, this is it. This is the thing that's going to reduce amputation rates. This is going to what's going to lead to wound healing. Uh, we just have, we just don't have those answers. Um, two of the upcoming studies we have, we have hemostemics, uh, which is a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial looking at uh, blood drive from autologous angiogenic precursor cells. So the patients <clears throat> get blood drawn, it gets shipped off. They're specifically looking at endothelial progenitor cells that secrete um, some of these growth factors. And again, the substance is a mixture of uh, the APCs cons consisting of CD31 and CD34 cells. Um, the study, again, the most, of, as most of these are, these are critical limbskemia patients that have breast pain, ulcers, or gangrene. They're not candidates for any revascularization. Uh, you draw the blood, you get the cells back, you inject them into the leg under uh, conscious sedation. Their primary endpoints are de novo gangrene, doubling of the wound size, major amputation or death. Secondary endpoints, you, they want to look at the pain scores, ulcer size, toe pressures, um, AVI pressures. We have another study, PACE study, um, which is a randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled study looking at PLX, PAD. This is the, the name of the uh, cell that we're going to use. It's allogenic ex vivo expanded placental mesenchymal cells. Um, and these have high expression of CD105, CD73, and CD29. Don't ask me what all these things stand for because I have to usually memorize these. They secrete lots of proteins for angiogenesis and muscle cell perforation. Um, and we haven't started. This is still going through the IRB stuff. The study is designed, again, for patients who are not suitable for any revascularization. Um, these are the criteria they have to meet in terms of ankle pressure, toe pressures, um, how big their wounds can be. We're going to follow them up for 12 months after randomization. Primary endpoints, again, are going to be time to amputation if they need revascularization, which is really not going to be relevant because most of these patients aren't candidates for revascularization. Doubling of wound size, any de novo necrosis in the index limb, and then all-cause mortality. So as you guys know, last year, uh, uh, UC Davis, is, uh, Calif uh, the, the CIRM, which is the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, awarded $8 million to start the Alpha Clinic. Doctors Nolton and Abid are kind of heading that. Um, the Alpha Clinic has partnered with the CTSC, and both of these studies, we actually are working with the Alpha Clinic. Um, I think it's a good way for us to collaborate with other people in our institution. UC Davis's Institute for Regenerative uh, Cures, Dr. Nolta and Dr. Fiero have a lab. They have been looking at critical limb ischemia, or, um, at least in the mouse model, for a long time. They have been looking at mesenchymal cells from uh, human donor uh, marrow and they have engineered it to produce high level of the uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. They have looked at this, and that has been shown to increase the blood flow in the ischemic limb of the uh, immune deficient mice. This was actually the basis for our CIRM grant, which we had a few years ago, which unfortunately we lost. We never got to the phase one part of the study. There was a lot of back and forth, and we didn't meet the milestones. Um, they had shown that also that, that the cells actually remained at the injection site for a month after. Uh, this slide I got from Dr. Fierro. He, he was kind enough to share it with me. This is what they're working on now with rabbits. Um, and this is their hind link ischemia model. Here's these angios, which is amazing. They can do angiograms in rabbits. Um, and this is what it looks like after it's been ligated and divided. And this is after they've done the mesenchymal and the VEGF. And as you can see, um, they have an increased blood flow. And again, these are just the number of animals they're doing now, but they're doing it in rabbits. Um, so I think the challenges of stem cell therapies are that you don't completely understand all the mechanisms for how neovascularization happens. Um, we still need to identify which cell types and which sources are going to result in the best benefit for these patients. Uh, there are some studies that show like the CD34 um, have promising results in, in, in wound healing. Um, cell dosage, cell survival is another component that's been talked about. Um, a group used human decellularized adipose tissue scaffolds to provide a microenvironment for angiogenesis. And again, the final thing is, do we know is intramuscular, interarterial, the most adequate way? That's all we know. That's all we have right now. Um, so I think it's a, it's a point of, uh, of discussion still. So 
PAD remains a challenge. Our ultimate goal is limb salvage. There are some promising results for PAD. They're not perfect. Uh, most of these studies exclude some of the sickest patients we see with CLI, which are the renal failure patients. And some of the things to kind of think about is, is and, and they do this a lot more in, in Europe because they don't have all the IRB and all the FDA regulations. They do the stem cell size in claudicates, which is not a group we really think about doing it in. Um, when we went to Spain for the CIRM grant, they, were, they had this compassionate use and they were using this for um, patients who had claudication. There's a couple of studies that have shown that their amputation rates at five years is less than the people who didn't get therapy for claudicans. So that's a thought just in terms of where do we take this? Can we prevent these patients from even getting to the point of uh, critical limb ischemia without you know, surgery and intervention? Uh, and in the, uh, in, the, in the spirit of Halloween, I'll share a few Halloween pictures. These are old now because my kids are six, but I show these because I always talk about my lack or uh, lack of uh, having control over what they wear. Uh, this was got neons ago. They're, yes, they're looking at this foot. No, they're actually um, looking at the garbage truck. Uh, this was Meryl Simon's idea that I would put that ugly foot over there. Uh, the garbage truck is always very fascinating. This was last year because we wanted to go as boxes, which is the cheapest thing you can put your kids in for Halloween. And I wanted to do a study to see if they got more candy because people felt sorry for them. Uh, but they got the same number as the, the sheep did. So, um, and this is this year. So one went as a zombie and a banana and a doctor. So thank you. I'll entertain questions. Sorry, I talked fast, so you guys are done early, so. No, this is great, Nassim, it was fabulous. And, you know, obviously everybody hears about all the stem cell stuff we're doing with Spina Bifida. Yes. It's really good for this audience to appreciate that there's more to stem cells yeah. than just what I do. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Um, and we have known that these trials have been going on in vascular for quite yeah. a while, and I think it's really interesting to see sort of where they are yeah. and what's Absolutely. happening. Yeah. So in addition, we always love seeing the three kids that you had while you were in the triplets that you had, which, you know, it's like still mind-blowing. Um, so I think we have some time for questions. I think this is really uh, an interesting and provocative area. We, uh, every resident in this room has had the privilege of taking care of mm -hmm. these really desperate patients yeah. with some of these diseases we can't help. So questions or comments? Or, yeah. Yes. Get stem cell people. Will. Stem cell people, of course. Just remember, no basic science stuff. So the primary outcomes, like the amputation rates, yeah. haven't been great for a lot of these yeah. trials. Um, and a lot of the criticism, as you alluded to, was that you're not getting access to these tissues because yeah. of the arterial disease. Yeah. So in your opinion, now having worked with it, is the answer to pair it with revascularization procedures so that limits your recovery or to still pursue Yeah, so that's what uh, Juventus was, or that trial that we did with the JVS 100, was that it was combined with revascularization. Because again, there are patients that you revascularize and you're like, why doesn't it still heal? There's something still that we're missing. So I think, and, and it goes also to the point about claudicans, putting claudicans in these studies, is that we're missing something. And if you can prevent them from getting to that point. And I think the other thing is, unfortunately, that a lot of these studies won't get into. There's a lot, as you guys have, most of you guys have been on vascular, you know that there's a lot more than just revascularizing, right? It's debriding the foot, you know, getting rid of infection making sure the nutrition is perfect. There's a lot of components that you miss in these studies because you don't know. Like the picture I showed where the guy's heel now looks amazing, that just didn't happen overnight. This is months of wound care and come to clinic next week and let us debride it and let us put you in the hospital and put you on IV antibiotics. So it's multifactorial and I think you, you know, if you just plan on just saying, I'm gonna inject your leg with stem cells and you're gonna do great is not really the answer. And so ultimately I think we do need to expand on having patients who get revascularized and get stem cell therapy, or including patients with claudicans and follow them long term to see how far it can. Because you have historical data, you can certainly follow any claudicans at the VA and then see what happens to them over five years and then compare them to people who get stem cell therapy. Well, of course, the problem always with the historical data is that placebo effect yeah. you talked about. You, yeah, know, yeah. you just come in and get all that attention. Yeah. Then you, you yeah, you report that you're having less pain. Yeah. Next panel. Yes. Great, great talk. You know, a big issue which I think is receiving more attention to the global and biomedical research is sort of the use of superlatives and the accentuation of the positive uh, you know, for a variety of reasons. You 
know, uh, given that a lot of the data that you show is sort of negative data, how do you think that would be impacting the field? Know, uh, um, I think, unfortunately, it does impact it, right? Because it becomes harder and harder to get some of these studies off the ground. Because these are very expensive studies. That There's no doubt about it. You're following for, like, the one study that we haven't started yet, they want the patients to come in literally every month to take pictures of their wounds and stuff. So I think the cost becomes a prohibitive factor, and that's why I think a lot of these trials are from industry sponsored, just because of that. The CIRM grant that we had, that which unfortunately Vascular Center lost, is because we weren't meeting the milestones. You know, they want kind of quick answers and they want it to be sexy, and it's not. This is not the sexy group. Like, you know, you have. You know, Dr. Um, Nancy Lane has the osteoporosis, and she still has her, like, nearly $20 million grant because it's osteoporosis. You know, no one's losing their leg. These patients aren't as sick as our patients. So it's harder to make this the sexy disease that anyone wants to throw a lot of money onto. But I think you have to kind of take it point by point. I mean, there is some improvement. You got, you're not going to see improvement in everything, right? And a lot of these studies kind of have, some have shown improvement, some haven't. But the ultimate thing is looking at the cost of what it costs to take care of these patients with these amputations, right? Because these are the, the, the cost is staggering of what we have to do to take care of these patients who don't, aren't able to save their limb. Uh, but I, I, to answer your question, I, really, I don't know what we're going to have to do because it is still it's in, in its infancy. I think even though it's been done over the last 10, 15 years, it's still kind of coming along. Um, Jan Nolta's group, this is something they've been working on for years now. I think this was even stuff that Jan was working on before she even got, came to UC Davis. It's shown promising results, but again, the CIRM wanted it in big animals. I think last year I looked at a grant that we were going to use some of the sheep from Dr. Farmer's lab for that, which is, which is hard, and it's expensive to use such a large animal for an ischemia model. Now they're using rabbit, you know, and hopefully if they can show that there is an improvement, then you can try to get the CIRM grant, you know, another CIRM grant for it and have a phase one clinical trial, but but it's hard. It's really hard. So we do have a stem cell expert, Dr. Wen. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. So I, would, I was going to give a comment on the stem cell and the biomedical research they're doing as a surgical biomedical laboratory. We're developing lots of a variety of different type of a stem cells with different functions, also biomaterial based approaches. To, uh, to respond to one of your comments you made about the uh, cell dosing and survival, that could be a, something um, we can work together and to, to get some innovative, innovative approach. Absolutely. Typically, specifically to the cells you mentioned about the uh, endothelial progenitor cells. So, what what do you see the difference in terms of the, your clinical expectation? between bone marrow graft MSCs, for example, or non-nuclear cells versus endothelial cells. What would you expect to see the difference? Uh, I, to be honest with you, I don't know. I mean, th this is something where, again, most of the studies I looked at, you know, I, there, there's groups of studies that have used the endothelial progenital cells and they show improvement in the wound healing and all that stuff. And again, you don't have granular data about what kind of care these patients are getting. You know, I use my own anecdotal experience about how much goes into trying to keep those limbs on these patients versus the mononuclear cells or the mesenchymal cells. I mean, we've sort of been part of both types of studies, um, and the new studies that we have are kind of, you know, kind of involve both of them. But the real question is, do these effects last, right? How long do these stick around in ischemic right. tissues? And that's the thing. And if you think that the you know, endothelial progenital cells are likely to you know, stimulate other things and get other cells to that ischemic area and last longer, then maybe your results are going to be better because you are able to maintain that. That's one of the things that also, like Jan Nolto's group is looking at to see how long these stick around in the tissue. It's much harder to do that in humans, right? Unless you say that every patient that's going to end up with an amputation within the next month, we're going to take their tissue and look at it and see whether or not we can determine if anything still stuck around or what changes we saw in their actual tissue. But I think that's the hard part. That's why I kind of like that one study that looked at responders and non-responders because they looked at some of those inflammatory markers in terms of who was a responder in terms of wound healing and who wasn't. And I think that's the one thing 
more studies will need to focus on is to trying to figure out is there a difference between those that heal and don't and then you can say how can we affect those markers and those factors you know can you reduce this to try to get them to heal or increase this to get them to heal I just wanted to make a comment and I think everyone sort of touched upon this and this is really what we're trying to build as we develop our PD program <laughs> Diabetes is on the rise, PAD is a, is a big component of that. We see a lot of patients with advanced PAD, and we see a lot of patients here at this institution who have limited or no revascularization uh, options. And there's been a lot of studies that have shown that a uh, team-based approach with, with faster surgery and good wound care and so forth really improve outcomes. Most of us in the field are very hopeful that there will be a niche for set for stem cell based therapies for these patients. It's not yet well defined, but I think we here at UC Davis, with with the stem cell center, are really um, positioned to contribute to that expansion of knowledge. And that's what we're really hoping to do. We expand our PD program here. So we're really excited about these two trials. Which Okay. Dr. Brown. I just had a question about the non-responder versus responder kind of definition. Because the markers that they're using are readily available in blood. You can't say that it's like causative markers rather than like sort of like what you observe as a result. And so, I don't know, I, I guess it seems to me like stem cells have sort of been pushed a little bit aggressively because it's the hot thing. And instead of like thinking about what is it actually doing, kind of like your last studies were talking about, like is it like fostering like hematopoiesis, angiogenesis kind of thing? They just sort of are looking to see the results, and I think that they have to probably better define how they're going to measure the respondents versus non-respondents with causative markers rather than sort of like observational markers that are just the results of the tissue. Uh, and just a final question, have they looked at cell-free matrices or, or uh, scaffolding in comparison to the, uh, the actual stem cells? Because it seems like it would be potentially cheaper, you don't have to deal with all the regulation stuff that you have with the cells. And then the question is, which lasts longer or sort of more durable than the actual cells? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's been cell stuff and there's been gene therapies. I know long, about 10 years ago, there was some gene therapy trial that Dawson was involved in, but I, I don't know. And, and that's a good point, is that, is there something better than the cell therapies we're thinking of? I mean, the whole point of it is sort of, as a schematics for angiogenesis and vasculogenesis, you're trying to kind of increase that response, right? Whether it's for the EPCs or the mesenchymal cells, um, but which one is the perfect thing and that's the thing I think most of these meta-analyses have looked at is that there is no perfect thing the mesenchymal cells mononuclear cells you know cord cells it and and you're right that, that people sort of jump the gun and a lot of these studies will just primarily look at one specific thing but a lot of the newer trials are also trying to kind of capture you know peripheral blood to just look at some of these factors but again you're right you don't know whether you know CRP is elevated because the patient's got an infection or they're sick or something else is going on. So it's hard to kind of hang your hat on that because you don't know if it's an effect or just the cause of it. But I think that's the thing we sort of need to focus on a little bit more with these stem cell studies is sort of really try to split, not just at the end of the day say, okay, here's a paper and these people, you know, had no amputation and these got an amputation and we don't know what to say about it, but really go back and see is there something between those two groups that defines what makes a difference in them um, being able to, you know, salvage our limb versus, you know, not. Certainly one of the challenges in the whole stem cell field is separating the rigorous scientific work from the guys that are doing the point of care, you know, whether it's for aging, limb therapy, whatever else you need, because you can do that without FDA approval. So the minimal, you know, in operating room, do your bone marrow biopsy, do something minimal to the cells and then put them in a patient can be done which is why some of these companies, you know, it's a lot of money in, yeah. in bogus yeah. therapy, right? So yes. For for diseases that have no treatment and and for aging, you know, a lot of them you get you can get your stem cells. To, I've been looking for little ones that you know. Maybe. <laughs> anyway.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.